All right, everybody, welcome back for section 13! Yay! I know you're all excited. We are nearing the end of the semester. Just a bit more to go. This is going to be a short one, so stay with me. Um, here's our funny internet picture of the day. And um, I chose this because we are, in fact, talking a little bit today further about re-entry and recidivism, um, which we, we, we touched on briefly in the last section. Uh, but I wanted to talk just a little bit more about the research around it, um, kind of what we know about um, how people um, end their incarceration time and come back into society. So uh, there are a lot of, of problems with people going from prison back into uh, you know a regular life. Um, the first is drug use. Okay, seventy-five percent of incoming prisoners have some kind of alcohol or drug abuse problem, okay? Very few of them get treatment. For, for people in prison, it's only about 10% get treatment. For people in, in jails, only about 3% get treatment. So the vast majority of the people with um, alcohol or drug abuse problems going into prison uh, or jail are going to come out without having any, they haven't had any real um, help trying to fix that alcohol or drug abuse program. So when they get out, what are they going to do? Of course, they're going to go back to their, their alcohol and drug abuse um, lifestyles. That is probably a major catalyst of them getting sentenced to prison or jail in the first place. Um, education problems. 41% of the people in prison don't have a high school diploma. And this is the 21st century. I mean, you can't find a job practically anywhere without a high school diploma. That is... Um, it makes it very, very difficult for them to re-enter society. Um, they, if we want people to not recidivate, they need to be able to have jobs and support themselves. But if they don't have the educational tools that they need to get a job and support themselves, they're much, much, much more likely to recidivate. Um, people who come out of prison nearly half of them earn less than $600 a month. That is ridiculously low. That is like half the price of my mortgage alone. Um, so that puts them in very tenuous housing circumstances. Um, that puts them in very difficult, you know, trying to find food circumstances. Um, sometimes they have to live with with friends or relatives that might be very bad influences, but they don't have the choice because they can't afford to live anywhere else. And that can cause them to be more likely to recidivate. And then about a third of people coming out of prison have some kind of physical or mental disability. It could be um, major depression disorder, it could be schizophrenia, could be... Um, you know, AIDS or TB, as we discussed um, in the last section, could be a lot of different problems, but a third of them have some kind of, of physical or mental disability, which makes it much more difficult to reintegrate into society. Make sense? Okay. There's a very big problem in the United States with a lack of support services for former prisoners, okay? So first off, in many jurisdictions, you are legally required to live in the same county you were living in before you got arrested. Now, the reason they do that is to try to keep tabs on ex-prisoners, especially if you're on probation or parole or, or, or whatever. Um, but if you live in that same county, you're going to... Um, be around the same influences, the same peers, the same economic situation, the same family, all these things, the exact same situation which got you into crime in the first place. So that's going to be a very difficult um, separation. If you can't be physically separated from those bad influences, um, it's going to be very difficult to be really uh, uh, not let them affect you. Okay? About 12% of, um, of former prisoners um, are homeless, uh, which makes it very difficult for their parole officer to track them down, find them, make sure they're doing the things they should be doing. 
Um, there, if they have social worker, case workers, it makes it way more difficult to um, not only to, to track them and to get them the help they need, but also for them to find a job. I mean, most jobs these days, they require you to have a home address. If you don't have a home address, it's very difficult to, to you know, perform that reintegration that we want former offenders to, to create. Um, most jurisdictions have no drug or alcohol support, as we touched on on the last slide, um, which means if you have some kind of abuse problem, um, hey, deal with it yourself, which is never a, a good way to get people to actually deal with problem. Um, and of course, the places that these people are able to live based on their education, based on their um, income based on all those factors are almost universally going to be bad neighborhoods, which puts them around even more socially disorganized areas, um, which just kind of sets them up for recidivism. Okay. Um, criminal justice researchers have done tons of research into how the length of your sentence affects recidivism. And there's been a lot of kind of mixed results. Um, there have been some studies that show that uh, the longer your sentence up to a certain point, the less likely you are to commit crime when you get out. Um, this is obviously controlling for age. So um, we all know the age crime curve, which we discussed uh, in an earlier section. So if you are in prison for 20, 30, 40 years and you get out, you're much older, so obviously you're going to have a much lower um, um, uh, recidivism rate than somebody who's 20, 30, 40 years younger than you. Um, but controlling for age, they've found that um, some research has shown a, an effect up to a certain point. So, um, you know, an increased sentence up to some research says 1.2 years, some research says five years. Um, increasing sentences up to those points causes reduced recidivism, um, but past that point, there is no increased kind of specific deterrence effect. Um, there's also research that shows that if this reduction in recidivism does appear, it only lasts for so long. So it only reduces the recidivism rate of people coming out of prison for a year or two before their recidivism rates um, go back to, to kind of normal, if you will. Um, and then there's other research that says that the length of sentence really doesn't have any impact on, on um, recidivism rates. So that's one of those areas that um, it's very interesting. It's a very um, uh, developed area of, of study, but we can't get any really good standard agreed upon conclusions about. Um, another problem with reentry is probation and parole officers are usually vastly overworked. So um, probation and parole officers both, um, you know, in a lot of counties, especially rural county, or especially, I'm sorry, urban counties um, with high crime rates, you know, we're supposed to have, you know, pulling numbers out of thin air, a probation officer is supposed to, to have a maximum of 20 probationers under them. Um, but because of budget cuts, because of all kinds of problems, instead of 20, which is supposed to be the max, they have 25 or 30, you know? Um, so they're supposed to go check in on their people, you know, once or twice or three times a month, um, but they just don't have the time. They're, they're, they have too many people that they're supposed to supervise. They don't have the time to focus on the people that they're supposed to be helping, supposed to be finding jobs for, supposed to be making sure that they get to their treatment, supposed to be, you know, um, helping. And thus the probation and parole process, which is supposed to kind of be, you know, how to be a human 101, how to be, how to integrate into society training, um, really doesn't work because the, the person who's supposed to teach you, this person who's supposed to mentor you just doesn't have the time to do it. And it stinks, but, you know, that's the reality of the world we live in today. Um, there also becomes kind of a vicious cycle when parents of children um, get locked up for a long amount of time. Um, so a father or a mother 
gets locked up for years, the child has to grow up without that parent, um, that results in, in lower social bonds, uh, higher influence of, of delinquent peers, um, lower economic status, so they have to live in places with more social disorganization. It results in all kinds of um, negative crime influencing effects. Um, so those children are then likely, more likely to grow up um, and become criminals. So it becomes this vicious cycle where, you know, we can track through families where every generation, you know, the fathers and mothers are going to prison and thus the kids grow up without fathers and mothers and thus they become, you know, go to prison later in life. And, it, and it, it's really, really difficult um, to break out of that cycle, which is one of the reasons why they're trying to do things such as um, letting children stay with mothers in uh, special areas of female prisons. Um, that's kind of the, the first step towards trying to fix that. Um, and then that last one on there is um, a term that comes from the late, great George Carlin. George Carlin was one of the greatest stand-up comedians of all time. Um, he had a lot to say about a lot of this stuff. Um, but one of the things he pointed out with things similar to, to um, you know, everybody wants um, alcohol support services. Everybody wants uh, services to help probationers and parolees and halfway houses and all these things. But nobody wants it near them. Right? And he came up with this term NIMBY, which stands for not in my backyard. Right? So yeah, I want more halfway houses so parolees can have more supervision, but not in my backyard. I want this, I want that. I want more alcohol and drug rehabilitation centers, but not in my backyard. And when everybody says not in my backyard, uh, where are you gonna put these things? The place where they're gonna do the most good are places where we can't put them because the surrounding area will lose their minds and get all upset. Um, so that has become a big problem with um, support services and trying to get help for people who are trying to integrate back into society after uh, a prison sentence or a, or a jail term or, or whatever. Um, they have done some very interesting um, intermediate sanction uh, trials and, and um, uh, uh, you know, beginnings of, of these programs that show a lot of promise. Um, one of the ones that shows some promise is intensive probation, okay? So this is where instead of a probation officer, say having 20 people that they're assigned to keep track of, they only have like two or three or five or you know, a much lower, lower number. So that probation officer can really spend time with the person on probation um, rather than, uh, 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 you know, having so many people under them that they can't spend any time with them, right? So it's a fix to that problem we talked about in the last slide. Um, and they tried this in New Jersey and the kind of technical and legal violations um, dropped from 52% of probationers to only 17% of probationers. So this was a huge, huge, huge help in um, reducing the number of people on probation who are messing up. So the, the increased oversight from their probation officer was able to help them find a job, stay out of trouble, stay away from delinquent peers, you know, um, get rid of those criminogenic influences in their life. Does that make sense? All right. Um, there's also what's called split sentencing or shock incarceration. Um, this has, uh, essentially this attempts to scare people, okay? Um, it, in essence, what you do is you get sent to jail or prison for, you know, a few weeks, a few months, whatever, and then the judge calls you back up and says, hey, how'd you like that? Did you like sitting in jail? Did you like sitting in prison? To, of, of course, you're gonna answer, no, that was scary, I hated it, like, uh, you know, this was terrible. Judge says, all right, well, you can do probation for the rest of your sentence, but if you mess up, you're going back to that place that you tried out and it was really scary, remember that? So it's an effort to kind of scare people into um, realizing what the alternative to probation is. It gives them kind of an idea of what's gonna happen to them if they don't 
follow their probation officer's advice if they don't, you know, kind of get along with the program, try to fix their life um, and fix these problems. Um, has it really worked? I don't know. Um, there have been similar programs. Um, the ones that come to mind are Scared Straight, which is a program where they take kids who have, have committed some kind of juvenile delinquent act and they take them to, um, you know, like an adult prison and they have kind of volunteer adult prisoners that volunteer to just kind of scare the heck out of these kids. And, you know, the intention there is to, you know, to scare them straight. So they're terrified of prison. They're terrified of getting in trouble later in life. So they clean up their act. Um, that has been shown to actually increase the rate of, of uh, criminal activity uh, for people who have gone through that program. So that is a terrible idea. Um, similarly, D.A.R.E. Anybody go through D.A.R.E. when they were a kid? Drug Abuse Resistance Education? I did, back when I was in middle school. Um, one of my favorite stories ever, I hope this is true. This is probably an urban legend, but I, I really hope this is true because this is brilliant if it is. Um, a D.A.R.E. officer had three uh, little marijuana joints and he's passing them around to high school class so that people can kind of smell it and you know feel it and see what marijuana smells and feels like and the the, the dare officer says all right you know the 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 door to this room is shut if i don't get all three of these back by the end of the class um you know i'm going to strip search strip search everybody and look in your backpacks and nobody's leaving this room until i get all three of these back and blah 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 kids are like all right so it comes time to pass them back up, and when they pass these joints back up, he has four. <laughs> oh, wrong button, sorry. There we go, there's the last um, Yeah, that always, that story really kind of illustrates that A, uh, uh, you know, humor can happen anywhere, but B, dare was a really dumb idea. They've actually found that um, dare increases the rate of drug use um, amongst people who have been through the program. Um, so split sentencing, shock incarceration, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not, uh, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Optimistic. Diet Coke always helps the brain work. I'm not optimistic. Uh, similarly, boot camps. Okay, boot camps have been a program that have been very um, popular in the last uh, few decades. Essentially, um, they're for juvenile offenders, and they're kind of a mimic of a military boot camp uh, or basic training environment, right? So these juveniles go into this, this military-style environment. There's kind of the equivalent of a drill instructor. Uh, you know, they sleep in kind of a military-style barracks, and they get woken up early in the morning and yelled at by their sergeants, and they get, you know, they run around, and they do push-ups, and they do obstacle courses, and they do all this stuff, and it's kind of designed to be similar to that military basic training. And the theory is this will instill discipline, this will instill a sense of, of duty, and it will, you know, do all these things. Now, the preliminary research on this essentially says, oh yeah, the, the kids who go through this boot camp program are much, have much lower recidivism rates than the kids who go to juvenile detention facilities. Oh, they must be great, right? Oh, such reduced recidivism. Oh, this is amazing. The problem is, if you look at those studies, the kids were not randomly assigned to boot camp or juvenile detention in a lot of these cases. The kids who went to the boot camps were a different sec a different subsection of the juvenile delinquents. They were the ones who would have had a lower recidivism rate anyway. There are very few studies that actually randomly assign children to the boot camp or to the non-boot camp. So um, a lot of that research is kind of um, has that obvious flaw in it. Um, who knows? They might work, but the Studies that, that use a, a non-random sample for those, um, or non-random assignment for that, uh, that kind of study, um, those are basically useless, okay? Um, so, uh, another thing that's become really, really interesting lately, um, especially just in the last few decades, is home confinement or electronic monitoring, okay? We've all seen uh, 
you know, images on TV or, or on the internet or whatever of people wearing those anklets with the black thing on their ankle, that's uh, uh, electronic monitoring, right? So, so the probation office or the parole office or whoever can know that essentially that you're at home at any given point. Now, what's really, really cool about this, I love this, is that the idea for the first electronic monitoring device came from Spider-Man comics. Can you believe that? It's a, an example of a superhero um, in the comics actually um, influencing the modern world and making the world a different place and better place, hopefully. Um, but there was a there was an episode of Spider-Man where uh, the Kingpin uh, decided he wanted to know where Spider-Man was at all time. So he attached somehow, I don't remember exactly how, but he attached this electronic monitoring device to Spider-Man and um, uh, essentially was able to monitor everywhere Spider-Man went. And there was a judge um, who, who read this comic and was like, wow, that's, that's kind of brilliant. Why can't we do that with bad guys? And so he came up with the first generation of electronic monitoring devices. Now, the first generation, um, this was before GPS, this was before uh, Wi-Fi. This was before a lot of this new technology. Um, and in the first generation, basically, um, there would be a mounted base station somewhere in your house connected to a phone line. And then your anklet would have to be within a certain range of that base station, you know, 100 feet or 150 feet or whatever it is. Um, but the the probation office or the parole office or the court or whoever was in charge of the electronic monitoring didn't monitor you 24 seven. They would just call you at random times of the day. Could be twice a day, could be 10 times a day, and it would be at random times. And when they called, essentially that phone call, it was like a fax machine or, or, a, or a modem, and it would say, hey, is the anklet within the you know 100 feet or 150 feet, whatever the range was, of the base station right now, yes or no? And the, the base station would say, uh, let me check. Is the anklet within so many feet? Yes or no. And it would send that answer back. So you could theoretically leave your house if you wanted to gamble on being back before any of these phone calls came in. Um, so people did that and it was, it, it worked for the most part, um, but obviously there were, there were some some what I hope are fairly obvious flaws. Um, so they wanted to upgrade it, they wanted to make it better. So in the second generation, it was an automatic thing. Instead of a call in to check, it was a call out with a fail. So essentially you still have the base station, it's still connected to the phone line. Um, but now, anytime the anklet gets farther than X number of feet away, the base station would call the probation office and say, hey, my anklet left range, like, just letting you know, the guy left, you know, however much range. Um, and that was a lot more difficult to um, fake or to, to um, fool, okay? Now, the third generation, which is what kind of what we're in today, has completely gotten rid of the base station, um, and now it's just GPS. We're able to use the GPS system so that the probationer, the parolee, um, or the, the, the probation officer, the parole officer can just check at any given time uh, where their person is and can even track them through time. So it's like not only where are you now, but where we were, you know, where have you gone over the last eight hours, right? So the probation officer can say, oh, okay, look, there he was. He went to work. Okay, then he stopped by the supermarket on the way home. Now he's at home, which is where he's supposed to be at this time of night. And, you know, um, so it, it, it's gotten a lot more complicated. Um, with these these home confinement electronic monitoring anklets, but there it's a very very cool piece of technology. Um, I'm a technology person. That's kind of my what I nerd out about. Um, other kind of reentry programs that are designed to help uh, people um, get back into society or never leave them. Um, there are a lot of faith based systems out there. Okay. Um, you know, Christian churches, Muslim churches, Jewish churches, um, they really like to go into prison 
try to bring people to the religion, hope to um, uh, uh, convert them and get them to live by the moral code of the religion. Um, and when it works, it's great. The problem with these systems are you cannot tell whether someone is really changing or whether they're just acting like they're changing. So no matter what religion you're talking about, when someone's in prison, if someone's a prisoner, they have a vested interest in making it look like they're now a good religious person who follows the laws of this religion, and I would never ever commit any more sins, and blah blah blah. They have a vested interest in making themselves look good, and if they want to, they can use these faith-based systems to, to kind of manipulate parole boards and manipulate these things. Um, and obviously not all of them do. There are people who legitimately find religion in prison and practice what they preach, and when they get out of prison, they're just as devout and just as devoted to their religion. Um, but you can't, there's no real way to tell the difference while they're still in prison. So how does the parole board kind of sort out the people who have genuinely changed, who have genuinely embraced this, this um, religious law and want, never want to, they want to go forth and sin no more? And how do they separate those people from the people who are just doing it for show and to make themselves look better so they'll be more likely to be released from prison early? Very, very, very difficult. Um, there is work release. Essentially, this is kind of a cool program um, because one of the big problems with jail stays and short prison stays is that you lose your job, right? So if you had a job before you went into prison, you're not going to have that job when you get out. Um, so one of the, the things that they can do or one of the things they've started doing is essentially um, during the day you get released from your facility you go work during the day, Monday through Friday, or whatever your working hours are. Then at the end of the day, you come back to prison and you stay there like nights and weekends. Okay? Uh, this is specifically designed so that people can either start, you know, not have to lose their job while they're in prison. Or, if they don't have a job before they get to jail or prison, they can be assigned a job outside and then work it during their jail or prison stay, and then when they get out, they can continue on with that job, right? Um, so this is a way to make sure that, that when people finish their prison sentence, they have a job, whether it's something they had before they went to prison or something they got while they were in prison, um, they, they are able to continue that after prison or jail. Um, the problem there is there's a very large stigma a social stigma, a social aversion to wanting to hire people um, who are felons or, or have been convicted of crimes, let alone people who are currently in jail or prison, right? A lot of, of um, employers don't want to hire somebody um, if they were formerly in jail or prison, let alone the people who are currently in jail or prison. Um, there's also a problem of kind of education and knowledge about how working works. Um, I know that phrase sounds kind of silly, but um, there was a story I read once where there was a, a probation officer, a parole officer or something, um, and he got one of his uh, people a job. And then the guy never showed up on the first day. And so he got him another job, and then he never showed up to that job either. And so he goes to this guy and he says, hey, why are you showing up to these jobs that I've gotten? Like, I'm, I'm pulling strings to get you these jobs. Why are you not showing up? And the guy says, oh, well, I didn't wake up in time. And the, the officer says, well, why didn't you, you know, what was your alarm set to? And the guy goes, alarm? And he legitimately had no idea what an alarm clock was or how to use one. Um, and it's, you know, that kind of basic knowledge of how to be a constructive member of society is a lot of times missing from these guys because they, they never, you know, they had such a, a different childhood and adolescence and early adulthood that they didn't learn the same things that most of us just kind of take for granted, like how to work an alarm clock. Um, they just never got that. They had a completely different experience than most people do. 
Um, and then there's the problem of ID. A lot of people, um, whether they're in jail, in prison, or just getting out of jail or prison, their only government-issued ID is their prison ID. They don't have a driver's license, they don't have an identification card, they don't have a passport, they don't have anything like that. All they have, the only government-issued ID they have is their prison ID or their jail ID. And that goes back to the stigma we were talking about earlier, where it's going to kind of um, uh, uh, make people turn away from hiring them. Um, there's actually a social movement going on called Ban the Box. This is a, um, a movement by a lot of people who want to see for, people who are formerly in prison, um, they want them to be more able to find jobs and get jobs. So essentially the, the purpose of Ban the Box is don't ask people if they've been, if they've ever been convicted of a crime at the beginning of the process, wait until much closer to the end of the process, okay? Because if you ask that question at the beginning of the process, um, you're going to use that as as kind of one of your first get rid of applicants thing. So if you have ten applicants for one position, and three of them once served prison time, we're going to toss those three immediately, and just kind of look at the seven who don't have that on their record uh, for that one position. Whereas Ban the Box says, instead of asking for it up front, wait until you're down to your last two or three. You've done some interviews, you've figured out, okay, these are the two or three people that, that maybe we can hire. Then ask if somebody's a felon. Because at that point, you might say, well, yeah, he served you know a year in prison 10 years ago, but well, okay, we can kind of see hiring him. It was a long time ago, blah, blah, blah. It makes it a lot easier for people to um, get into and maintain jobs um, and have more stakes in conformity, i.e. reasons why they shouldn't recidivate. Because um, if people don't have any reason to not recidivate, they're going to recidivate. But the more reasons we can give them to not do that, i.e. give them jobs, give them a house, give them, you know, make sure they have these things, they have more to lose and thus they're less likely to commit crime. Um, education release is, is very, very similar to work release, except it's for education instead of work, right? So it could be high school classes, it could be GED courses, it could be um, community college, it could be, um, you know, some kind of, of professional training. Um, but essentially, they, they do nights and weekends in the jail or the prison, but during the day, they're released just for um, educational purposes, going to classes, okay? Um, halfway houses. Halfway houses, uh, you see a lot of these in the media. Essentially, this is, you know, when you're six months away from being done with your sentence, instead of just, you know, living in the prison until the day you're supposed to be released and then going from prison to completely free um, and, and you know, that, that giant jump between prison and not prison, they, they have these halfway houses. So for the last three months, the last six months, the last however long, you leave prison and you're still a prisoner. You're still under authority of the Department of Corrections, but you're living in the community. Um, you're, you're, it's, it's halfway between prison and being free. It's, so you can look for a job. You have um, abilities to go out and socialize. You have the opportunity to, to do a lot of the things you couldn't do in prison, but it's not completely outside of the supervision of the state, right? Um, so it's it's kind of a, a slowly work your way back into society instead of just being tossed in um, like you would if you served every day of your sentence and then, oh, you're free now, bye. So it's, it's you know, it, it, it helps people transition from the prison lifestyle to the um, being free lifestyle. Um, day reporting centers are very similar to work release and education release, but in reverse. Um, and this is a way to control costs, right? Um, essentially, a day reporting center is where you report to the prison or the jail or the whatever during the day, and then you go home and sleep in your own bed at night, right? So unless you're working that day, um, you spend all day in the day reporting center, um, you know, being essentially uh, in jail, but also, you know, maybe doing some community service or doing something 
during the day, um, and then you can go home and sleep in your own bed at night. And this is a way, especially for very, very, very short sentences. So let's say you're, you're, um, you've been sentenced to 10 days in jail or something. Um, you can do that 10 days in jail as five consecutive weekends, right? So you do Saturday and Sunday, then the next week, Saturday and Sunday, then the next week, Saturday and Sunday. And um, this both saves taxpayers a lot of money um, and it allows you to kind of keep your job, keep your house, keep, you know, um, maintain a relationship with your family and your children and your siblings and all that stuff. Um, and then there's drug courts. So we talked a little bit about this in a previous section, but these specialty courts are doing a lot to help um, a lot to help not take people out of society in the first place. So if I'm a drug addict or I'm an alcoholic or I've got these problems and those problems are causing me to commit crime, um, that is a special problem and I need special solutions for that. So instead of going to a criminal court, I go to a drug court. The drug court knows better how to help me. Um, they might assign a special kind of probation. They might assign rehab. They might assign a special kind of community service. Um, and in that way, I don't get treated like any other criminal. I get a special kind of treatment based on my specific problem. And that can, can vastly reduce recidivism. So that is the end of the section. Thank you so much for watching.